Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India going to look at popular forms of music in this lecture. So obviously the question arises as to how some musical forms become popular and what are the factors that contribute to this popularity, historical factors, socio-political factors, economic factors um, and uh, would marketing and good packaging as they call it these days um, in itself be enough for um, any kind of music to become popular or are there other uh, things that are required uh, a particular kind of context in which this music has to be situated for it to become popular. And when music is popular. Um, a particular kind of music becomes popular, then the point is um, wh wh where are the points of agency uh, for the artists, for the forms of music and what kind of new patrons, what kind of new audiences are being formed when a new musical form comes into being or becomes popular. Um, so, and also who are left out. So, what kind of um, new uh, patrons and audiences emerge and what kind of patrons and, uh, patrons and audiences have been excluded when a particular kind of music becomes popular. And we all know that music keeps changing uh, with time popularity wise. So, obviously then we will have to situate music in that particular period in order to understand why something was popular say in the 1950s, but it will no longer work today. And why is something popular now which would not have been possible at all back in those days. So, these are some of the questions which come to mind when we talk about popular musical forms. Again. Um, can anthropologists uh, look at it? Should this be left uh, better to people in uh, management and uh, communications and other disciplines, even music, scholars of music uh, to look at it? Um, anthropologists are making an argument that um, you cannot understand music without looking, looking at the particular socio-cultural context and therefore it is very much an, an object uh, of a study for anthropologists as well. In fact, Milton Singer um, himself uh, said way back uh, in his work on when a great tradition modernizes, he said that cultural performances are to be seen as institutions in themselves and music is just one kind of performance. Um, and even in the 1960s, um, Alan Merriam had come up with a book called Anthropology of Music. Um, of course, it has taken a long time for um, music to become that important a study. Um, it is still located in, in um, a kind of interdisciplinary uh, topic called ethnomusicology uh, where a lot of people who study music locate themselves particularly from the anthropological perspective. Um, but ethnomusicology also focuses largely on uh, the structures of music and the technicalities of music, whereas an anthropology of music will not necessarily be focused so much on that um, as much as on um, why is this form now very popular, what conditions have made this popular, you know what communities and groups are associated with a particular kind of music and who are not and um, the kinds of um, hierarchies and divisions and uh, uh, various combinations that music can sometimes um, many times actually uh, cause uh, within a society and how certain forms of music can bring very disparate groups together, one we would not have imagined at all. 
Um, so, that is where an anthropological focus will be. So, there it differs a little bit from ethnomusicology um, and music uh, like any other uh, cultural object um, is performed, transformed uh, very much over a period of time. Popular music of course, uh, also has to have a little bit of support from uh, mass media and uh, their technological development becomes very key. As uh, we will uh, notice when we look at uh, more contemporary forms of music, but even within the last 100 years, if we have to look at uh, some popular forms of music, we will see that um, a technological development, whether it is a gramophone, uh, whether it is radio um, or now uh, you know CDs and uh, people are downloading music um, from online. The, the technologies of music um, also have a connection with the kind of music that uh, comes out at a particular period. Um, we will first look at uh, the work of um, scholar Amanda Weedman um, who uh, looked at uh, the classical music uh, scenario in South India. Uh, her field work was located uh, largely in Chennai, uh, which is where today Carnatic music uh, as it, the South Indian classical music is known is located. And her book is called Singing the Classical, Voicing the Modern. Um, the post-colonial politics of music in South India. So, that was her argument. So, we have to pay attention to the words that are there in the title, post-colonial, which means that she is looking at the um, kind of music evolution post-independence, but also tracing it uh, to the previous uh, decades. Uh, but she is looking at also the interface between defining what is classical and what is modern. So, in some sense we have to understand classical music within its location in the conditions of modernity that have emerged in South India. Whiteman also um, starts with explaining uh, how she came to learn uh, violin from a particular um, a teacher in Chennai and how that allowed her to be sort of like a participant observant um, into the classical musical scene in Chennai and uh, th thus her project began. So, what is classical music? Um, now, uh, Weidman argues that uh, classical itself is kind of an invention being given to this particular kind of music um, which was sung in the southern parts of the country. Uh, if one were to ask for origins, it will probably run uh, centuries. Um, but uh, broadly speaking, uh, she says that the evolution of uh, classical music in South India is always in terms of uh, differentiating itself from what is understood to be the western classical music. So, what is western classical music? Largely focused on instruments, whereas uh, the Indian classical both Hindustani as well as uh, Carnatic music is largely about singing. So, music essentially is about singing. The instruments are there and instrumental uh, instrumentalists are very important for a performance, but uh, the predominant uh, object there is the uh, singer, the predominant personality is the singer. And she says that this attention to voice is the most important factor in understanding South Indian uh, classical music or largely Indian classical music. And the, the other factors also which come into play vis-a-vis -vis the difference between Western classical and South Indian classical are um, the sort of focus on some kind of spiritual experience that music is supposed to give um, which is not the same in Western classical music. And 
Um, also, uh, that spiritual ex uh, experience borders into devotional as well. So, it is not just spiritual but devotional. So, bhakti becomes a very important uh, emotion um, in understanding music and classical in particular in the Indian context, which is not the same in the Western context. So, this is how a classical music in India comes to be differentiated from the western classical music. And all this differentiation, these kind of arguments and definitions are happening during the uh, fag end of the colonial period, um, late uh, 19th century, early 20th century particularly in uh, Chennai, uh, what was then called Madras. Because as uh, the colonial um, government becomes uh, more uh, structured and formalized and China, Madras becomes one of the places of power, uh, musicians start moving from courts uh, that were there in southern, uh, south of Madras from Tanjore and Madurai and other places and they are moving more and more closer to this big city, uh, which has certain elements all coming together at a particular point of time to enable the development of this tradition. So, what are the factors? So, in the book uh, she discusses these factors as um, the nationalist movements, um, technologies you know gramophone and then later on um, other technologies, uh, but also the colonial administration attracting large numbers of people from the upper caste um, who then are able to um, fund and build these organizations which play a very key role in um, music, uh, in the sort of development and patronage of classical music in Madras, Chennai as it is now known and even now, even today. Chennai is considered as the center for um, South Indian classical music or Carnatic music. Uh, if one has to be recognized as a performer, one has to be recognized in Chennai amongst the audiences there who are believed to be able to uh, discern the good from the not so good performer and things like that. But how did uh, that, that city come to acquire that? Uh, kind of uh, understanding and knowledge and patronage uh, for a particular form of music. Uh, in, in the book, uh, Weidman traces it over um, 100 years or more to show how this happened. So, there are institutions in Chennai which play a huge role. Um, and, um, and so, she concentrates in her work largely on the voice. She says the voice is the anthropological object for her in this work, like that is what she is focusing on. And, and uh, one can think about um, the, the voices that come to define in some ways the nation, um, the new Indian nation, the newly emerging Indian nation. And uh, late in another article, Lelyveld also talks about uh, these things. Uh, David Lelyveld, the scholar, um, uh, calling um, you know uh, there are people like uh, Lata Mangeshkar, for example, if one takes film music, or um, M. S. Subalakshmi, if one takes South Indian classical music, who are seen as voice of the nation almost. Um, these voices come to define who will who will be representing this newly emerging nation in the field of music. And incidentally, both are um, recipients of the Bharat Ratna. And um, M. S. Subalakshmi's um, uh, case is particularly interesting uh, from an anthropological point of view. Um, uh, and uh, you know, she came from uh, Madurai, a city south of Chennai um, and uh, learnt music and became a performer and the gramophone helped her uh, gain popularity very early 
and though not of uh, the upper caste, the Brahmin caste, by virtue of her marriage and uh, by virtue of her singing becoming very popular along with the nationalist movement in which her husband was involved at the same time and also her a brief um, a role in uh, our films as uh, Shakuntala, as me, as Mirabai, as Narada, um, uh, also enabled her to gain popularity. Her her way of dressing, her way of carrying herself, her personality, all came to be associated over a period of time with that of this uh, sort of good auspicious um, woman, um, the way a woman is supposed to dress and behave, particularly from the um, upper caste. And all of these things, um, in addition to her voice um, uh, and um, the kinds of songs that she chose to sing, um, infused with uh, bhakti, also enabled um, her as well as the kind of music to become representative in some ways of voice of the nation, um, at least um, of southern India and definitely of Carnatic music and um, the, Ch the Madras Carnatic music scene. And you know, she has uh, sung at the UN and was appreciated by uh, the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal Nehru. So, all these things uh, contribute uh, towards uh, making her what uh, eventually she becomes. Um, and you know, one can contrast that with say instrumental artists, for example, Purnutai, who is a player of uh, the Nagaswaram and who may also uh, have gained fame in their younger years, but it certainly does not uh, continue uh, for a long time. Now, another thing about um, M. S. Subalakshmi's music or even at that time one of the major debates in uh, Madras circles about dance and music was about um, tradition. How do you define traditional music? So, what is traditional music or what is traditional dance? Who were the singers and dancers before the upper caste? largely urban, middle and upper class uh, people began to patronize these forms of music. Who were the singers? Where were they drawn from? They were drawn from particular caste groups. Um, people belonging to upper caste may have uh, been singing at home, though majority of the compositions in uh, Telugu, Sanskrit and some in Tamil were largely composed by people from upper caste. A lot of these uh, musical performances also drew uh, from songs composed um, and during the Bhakti movements centuries ago. So, there is a lot of mix here. So, then how does one define what is traditional and what is not? And uh, here, one example from the field of uh, classical dance as it now is called uh, can be um, very illustrative. Um, and this was a debate that went between that went on um, between um, people uh, who believed in the kind of um, dance form that the Kalakshetra school of dance, dance produced through um, its founder um, Rukmini Devi Arundel and as opposed to the arguments made by artists like Bala Saraswati uh, who, who felt that uh, Bharat Natyam in its previous avatar as Sadhir dance uh, placed more emphasis on Shingar. So, one of the things uh, that gets uh, into this debate about tradition uh, versus um, non-traditional um, not necessarily modern at that time, but not traditional is what is the kind of emotion that has to come forth. So, while one, uh, while Bala Saraswati and uh, others would 
talk about Shrinara as a primary emotion, um, Rukmini Devi Arundel and the kind of dance form that um, later on came to be um, can look more into bhakti as the major form of emotion. So, all these kind of discussions about whether it is bhakti or whether it is Shrindara also in some ways are all about what is traditional and what is not and what kind of tradition should we keep. Firstly, we have to define what is traditional and then decide that that is the form that we have to keep. Um, so, Kalakshetra dance form is seen to be different from other there are many schools of dance. So, it is uh, not uh, that there is only there are only two schools of dance there are many schools of dance here. But these kind of debates um, allow us to kind of engage with the larger debate about how does one um, come up with a traditional form of art performing arts here in this um, lecture and then decide to keep it, to patronize it, who should patronize it, should it be the government, should it be the people. So, these kind of questions emerge. So, there are of course now questions being asked about caste and music, the close association between certain castes and certain forms of music and this runs across many different performing art forms. But largely the bigger discussion that uh, Amanda Weidman's book engages with is the politics of representation. Representations of uh, the voice, the voice that should be the voice of the nation, what kind of voice that should be, what kind of emotion should come through that voice and, uh, and a kind of voice which can be um, a sort of symbol for middle class uh, modernity, um, the sort of auspicious, pure, however one defines purity, um, all these kind of um, attributes are given to certain kinds of voices um, which then will not obviously allow for other voices to emerge. And um, like I said the technology uh, also plays a huge role. Um, while M. S. Subalakshmi was a very popular um, artist and Carnatic music is still popular even though in a uh, one would one can argue that within a smaller circle of people the bigger form of popular music in India is obviously film music. And uh, film music um, is um, as uh, referred to the common denominator everyone across India most people would be uh, listening to some kind of film music or another. And uh, um, in some ways film music also allows for the kind of regional identities to come to the fore. So, there are regional identities and then there is a national identity and just like cinema which can transcend boundaries, film music can also do the same and has done. Uh, the same. So, what uh, then the question is what can changes about music tell us about the larger society? Even if we take film music as an example there has been and even if we take just Hindi film music as an example as Gregory Booth has worked on um, largely. Uh, there is tremendous variation in the kind of music that was popular in the 1950s to today. How can we explain that? Uh, can we say that it is about technology? Certainly we can. Can we also say um, about the way in which music is now recorded and played? Um, whether music is recorded within a studio, whether music artists are performing open air, uh, the kind of training that artists, uh, musicians are now supposed to have uh, as opposed to then. Uh, in the past where are we drawing these uh, big singers from? Um, all these questions um, come into the discussion about how does this change happen? What factors enable this change? 
Now, one of the groups that Gregory Booth studied, um, Amanda Weidman looked at classical music, Gregory Booth looked at um, instrumental music made by these group of um, muse musicians or bands uh, which are very common in northern India particularly during the wedding season, but they can also be seen in southern India as well. Um, these are the group of people who dress in um, army regimental kind of clothes and uh, have a lot of western um, instruments and play Indian film music mostly. So, uh, and in his book uh, Brass Baja, Gregory Booth uh, traces this community of uh, band players and how they came to be in the bands and uh, you know what are their lives like. So, it is an ethnographic study um, and it, these brass band musicians are seen as ritual musicians. Uh, they are usual, usually invoked um, only during uh, rituals like marriages, but they occupy a very marginal position in um, the his uh, in the communities where they play. Uh, they are called uh, the Nankatai fellows, uh, the, the people who make biscuits which are called Nankatai. Um, and this kind of processional music does not have the same value that the classical music of Weidman study has in the popular perception. So, while this music is very essential and no marriage would be complete without this music, it does not necessarily occupy a very high status. Partly also because a number of musicians who are found in these bands come from the lower caste. Um, there are, they are not necessarily only Hindus, these musicians are drawn from other religions, there are many Sikhs and Muslims as well. Um, and some of them are also retired uh, from the army where they had been in the bands. Um, so, some of them are hereditary, you know, so it goes from father to son. But there are also newcomers, people who join um, this uh, music, musical bands as well. So, obviously, the major uh, income uh, generating uh, performance for them is the Bharat music, um, the kind of music that is played when a bridegroom um, goes to a wedding and is received by the bride's family that is called a Bharat and therefore, uh, these musicians uh, play what is called as Bharat music. But obviously, this happens on the street. So, just think about where a Carnatic performance happens. It happens, a Carnatic music performance usually happens in a big auditorium, big or small auditorium. Certain acoustical requirements are there. The artist is seated on the stage with all the accompanying instrumentalists and the audience is seated on chairs in the front. There is a space between the performing artist and the audience and the performing artist will be seated not standing and will start uh, the program uh, with a, a kind of invocation, um, a religious invocation, um, a small religious song and then more songs follow. But, so, there is a lot of quiet in the room um, except when the audience applauds after uh, a piece is uh, over. But usually, there is a kind of decorum that is um, expected and maintained and followed. Um, People who go to attend a performance know what is expected of them, both the artist and the audience. In these brass band performers, one of the issues apart from the fact that they are usually drawn from the lower um, caste is also the space where they perform. So, they do not perform inside any assembly hall or an auditorium, the, they perform on the streets. So, it is that space which also gives them this kind of a marginal position 
um, because you know uh, there are no listeners for them. I mean, nobody is standing around these uh, brass bands uh, waiting to hear what they will perform. Uh, people are just dancing, the music is just in the background and all the songs that they have is all filmy gana um, as Booth says. It is all songs drawn from the movies which um, very rarely would classical musicians resort. Their songs will be largely primarily composed of songs from um, the great uh, composers of the past like Tyagaraja or um, poets like uh, Bharati whereas these uh, brass uh, band musicians are playing songs from the movies. So, their marginality comes from the communities where they are drawn from, the space where they play, the songs that they play and, um, and the fact that there are no listeners. This is a performing group which has in some sense not a lot of audience. They are a ritual requirement almost and uh, you know everybody knows that they will play songs like uh, Baharo Ful Barsao, Aaj Mere Yaar Ki Shadi Hai. Everybody knows these songs and that is what they play. So, ev almost every um, Bharat will have these songs. So, they are also repetitive. One they are drawn from the movies and two they are repetitive. So, all of these things contribute to their position in the uh, performers group if you like um, in India. So, what are the technologies that have then um, made some popular while others have not. One very important uh, form a medium which has done this is radio. So, radio was a huge uh, uh, factor in popularizing classical music as well as well as film music. But obviously, uh, there are discussions, there were discussions about whether it should, it is a form of entertainment or is it not suitable for the masses, um, should it be avoided. Um, so, what do, uh, how does one get the radio to the people? So, these kind of debates have happened. Um, you know, what should be the music of the nation, for example, Lelywald. Uh, talks about in that article um, on music. Um, you know, should the radio play more classical music or should it be more focused on um, film music, uh, which is called as light music uh, in India. So, uh, and then uh, there were uh, some objections and worries about which one should be played and which one should not be played. And, um, and radio was also seen as uh, some kind of uh, determinant of um, one's uh, musical abilities. So, classical musicians for example, are graded um, as artist A, B uh, and so on. So, um, it also, also establishes uh, their musical abil ability and knowledge and capacity. So, one of the issues with uh, uh, playing a lot of um, uh, film music was also about the content of the film music and uh, but eventually film music had to become um, very uh, important because people were anyway listening to them. So, we also know that radio is a very important form for governments across the world. Everywhere um, radio is plays a very important role and so it does in India. Um, we also know that radio programs such as uh, Binaka Geetmala for example, uh, played a huge role in popularizing Hindi film music. Pe uh, people would huddle around to find out which were the top 10 songs um, in that time uh, and 
then comes um, Vivid Bharti, uh, All India Radio's um, station which plays uh, film songs um, and that also then become popular. So, the technology of radio popularizes film songs, it popularizes the voices of those uh, singers, it popularizes the films themselves. Films become popular because the songs are popular um, and uh, therefore, it it plays a huge role, it has played a huge role in popularizing film music before the technologies that we have today arrived. It was radio which played a huge role. Similarly with Carnatic classical music as well for people who could not always go to the um, auditoriums and listen to these songs, uh, there were also radio stations which played classical music and that also has a clientele. So, um, another technology which is very important um, in its role in making songs from films as well as classical songs popular are the gramophone, is the gramophone. So, um, what way in which gramophone recordings came to be was uh, partly through drama music in theatre, uh, in live theatre. There are artists um, on the stage and there are people with harmonium and a tabla or other instruments sitting around um, or standing and playing along with the uh, singer or the actors. Actors and, uh, and singers were one and the same. All those who acted could sing as well. Playback music as we call it now comes much later. So then um, these uh, gramophone recordings become very, very important uh, later on because then people can listen to the kind of music that they want. Um, you know, and um, uh, they have in some sense a lot more agency, the listeners in choosing the kind of music that they want to hear. So, his master's voice HMV comes uh, to India and uh, apart from M. S. Subalakshmi, another um, voice which in those days became hugely popular because of gramophone recordings and drama music and then uh, goes into films is that of um, K. B. Sundarambal whose voice also uh, is um, easily made available through gramophone records and establishes her popularity. So, we know music is popular, um, but why would music resonate with anyone except for those people who are from that particular region and for how long can it be sustained? This question is um, explored in Tejaswini Niranjana's work on music in the Trinidad and Tobago, where she looks at the popularity of uh, musical forms amongst people of Indian origin who, um, le who left India somewhere in the uh, 19th century, early 20th century. These Indians um, went as endangered labor to various countries um, in the West Indies um, as well as to Mauritius and other countries in Africa as well, Reunion, Mauritius, um, South Africa, they also went to Trinidad and Tobago. And in Trinidad and Tobago, um, largely um, drawn from pa, the Bhojpur, uh, Bhojpuri speaking region of India. So, in fact, Tejaswini Niranjana's book is called Mobilizing India uh, because a part uh, partly through their, um, through the popularity of a particular kind of music, um, it, the, the people of Indian origin settled there over nearly 200 years still invoke um, the, the, the nation that their ancestors left behind long time ago. So, there are two kinds of uh, musical forms that Tejaswini Niranjana looks at very closely. One is the Calypso, another one is the Chutney Soka. 
these are very popular in Trinidad and Tobago and she looks at um, you know how these things have come to be and how do people who have no memory of India or no experience of this land from where their ancestors came from uh, still recall that um, nation through their songs. Um, so, um, you, ma you might remember that um, some years ago, the, the Prime Minister then of Trinidad and Tobago, Kamla Prasad Bisesar, uh, came to India and she was given the Pravasi Bharati Adivas Samman and uh, she also um, uh, visited uh, her, uh, the, the, the place from where many of these uh, um, ancestors of uh, the current uh, residents in Trinidad and Tobago came from in those parts of Bihar and UP. Um, but particularly with regard to um, her work, there is a form of uh, musical uh, practice called tan singing, which is also very popular in Guyana and Trinidad. Um, but um, music in these regions is seen as a link to their tradition. So, it is music that is keeping them connected to this land they left um, hundreds of hundred or more years ago. So, obviously in the beginning these songs were all in the oral form, eventually they come to be written down. Um, so, there are groups of um, um, these uh, Trinidadians and people from Trinidad and Tobago of Indian origin living in uh, cities in the US who meet together on weekends uh, to practice tan singing uh, and other musical forms. So, technologies like the VCR helps them even more. Um, so, you know it helps them remember, it helps them recollect more frequently, replay and then see how they can sing um, better. But also through VCR they can also watch more Indian movies and learn newer songs. So, while um, the people who migrated to Trinidad and Tobago in the 19th century um, kept uh, these songs alive for a long time by passing them down, um, the popularity of um, Hindi film music from uh, the 1950s onwards has also been able to reach uh, the show, the countries like Trinidad and Tobago um, through technologies. So, now they also can recollect the newer um, songs uh, that are popular in India itself. Now, what are the songs actually about? Uh, the Calypso and uh, Chutney Soka songs are all about. Uh, what Tejaswini Niranjana shows in her work? Uh, very ethnographic is that um, these songs expose the racial tension that is there between people of Indian origin and people of African origin. So, there is a lot of discussion about the Indian femininity and African masculinity and there is also about um, emergence, there is also evidence um, shown in these songs of the emergence of the middle class in these places. Um, in fact, one of the song, uh, songs that is there in the book complains how Indian women are no longer um, keeping names like Sumintra, Ram Nalavia, Bulbasia. They used to have such names in the past and the song, the singer complains that now they all have um, names like Emily and Jean, which do not tell anyone anything about their Indian origin. But the songs also talk about people of the current uh, residents of Trinidad and Tobago who may be of Indian origin, um, but uh, they are as one person says in a song, I am neither here, I am neither one nor the other. You know, they are some kind of creoles in some sense. Um, you know, Jahajiba is the song which is very popular where this person calls for unity and says, let us not allow religion to divide us. We are all one, we are all Trinidadians and we should be together. We should not uh, be thinking about who is Indian and who is of African origin. Another 
um, song uh, uh, form which is popular there is chutney soka. Now, chutney soka is a mixture of bhajan, birha, chothal, all those songs which are found in the regions here in Bihar. Uh, so, there is a bit of Hindustani classical there. Um, so, the, the, the language is um, mostly Bhojpuri, um, instruments like dolak are used and uh, and there are songs sung by women during weddings in Trinidad which have been sung for a long time. Basically as Peter Manuel another scholar who has written a lot about music in India and Trinidad says it is basically Bhojpuri folk music that is being sung in Trinidad hundreds of years later. In addition the People in Trinidad also listen to songs from films as I mentioned before. So, there are huge uh, fan clubs um, for uh, singers like uh, Muhammad Rafi. Um, you know, uh, Tejaswini Niranjana mentions in her book that one of the most popular songs among Trinidadians um, of Indian origin is the song Brindavan Ka Kishan Kanaya um, from a film in the 1950s. But obviously, things have begun to change now. So, there are children who do not know much of Hindi or Bhojpuri, but they just sing the songs. Um, so, uh, there is um, uh, there is obviously tension there between um, what the older generation would listen to and like and what the younger generation who are trying to define themselves more as Trinidadians and not necessarily as um, a people of Indian origin. Um, so, you know there is one interview where she quotes about how um, the old elder generation uh, is telling her that the children cannot speak Indian as they call um, Hindi. Um, so, uh, these um, songs in some ways tell us the tension that is there in Trinidad and Tobago among uh, people of Indian origin who are trying to um, find themselves uh, in uh, a Trinidadian milieu, but at the same time uh, some of them trying to hold on to their Bhojpuri origins um, while the others um, are saying well that may be what is important for my grandmother, but not necessarily so for me. I define myself um, as somebody who likes Calypso and Chutney Soka and not necessarily um, you know Tan singing or bhajans. Um, so, all of these works that I have discussed here by Amanda Weidman, um, by Gregory Booth, uh, by uh, Tejaswini Niranjana and also by scholars like David Lelyveld and Stephen Hughes, all of them are basically talking about some common themes. One is what is tradition and what is modernity. And uh, will modernity change tradition? Uh, is tradition defined only within um, uh, its opposition to modernity? Can tradition exist without discussing modernity at all? So, that is one major theme. And another important aspect is how far can technology um, influence the kind of music one listens to, the spaces where music will be performed and the people who will um, be uh, the sort of drivers or agents of these kinds of music. So, there, there needs to be more research on newer forms of music um, in India and elsewhere for us to understand you know who are the main actors now. But from these studies what we understand is um, how technology can be an agent for changing musical forms, bringing new communities, excluding communities that do not have access to these technologies um, or who are prevented from accessing um, these technologies um, due to cost or location um, or something like that. 
the study by Tejaswini Niranjana also shows as do studies um, on um, the importance of cinema for the Indian diaspora, Niranjana's work also shows the importance of music for the Indian diaspora and how people who left um, India 100-150 years ago, um, communities that left have still kept these musical forms alive, but obviously the forms have changed significantly. Um, and uh, Gregory Booth's work also shows how um, a kind of musical performance that is considered very essential uh, and auspicious or signaling something very auspicious like a wedding uh, and celebratory like a wedding might actually um, still leave the performers in a marginalized position. So, popularity of music and popularity of musicians um, are very different things and only ethnographic research can show us these differences. Mm -hmm.